The debt ceiling, you talk about what the American people think. There's a new poll out today in the Washington Post that the Pew Research Center did with them, which shows more people are concerned about the potential of raising the debt ceiling than of government default. The argument that this administration has been making, which is that there will be disaster if the debt ceiling is not raised, it's going to send the wrong message to the world, is not taking hold with the American people. Why is that? Because they've never lived through it, and nobody knows what will happen. I don't think in a lot of these uh, areas, I think polling can be useful, but you can't be paralyzed for it because, by, because in the end, people hire the president and the Congress to win for them and to win for America. And a lot of the most important things I did as president were unpopular. 80% of the people were against the Mexican bailout, 74% were against the help I gave Russia to bring the troops home. Uh, the majorities were against the, what we did in Bosnia and Kosovo when we did it. Uh, lots of other things, the helping Brazil and, and uh, the, the things we did in America on the economy were not wildly popular. We lost the Congress over them. But I think in, you have to make these decisions based on where you think the end will bring you out. Of course, if the end doesn't bring you out all right for a decade, then you're toast. But when we have elections every two years, it's impossible to guarantee positive results from all these structural changes within that amount of time. And I think that's what happened in 94. It's what happened in 2010. But isn't leadership about bringing people along, even for the tough decisions, or especially Absolutely. for the tough ones? But, but I think what you have to do there is, uh, as far as I know, there's been no national presidential address yet, for example, on the consequences of America defaulting on its debt. Should there be? Yes, but not yet. I'm still not sure it's going to happen. I mean, whatever the polls say, if we defaulted on the debt once for a few days, it might not be calamitous. But if people thought we were literally not going to, not going to pay our bills anymore, and then they would stop buying our debt. One of the, the really troubling things to me about the decision to maintain all these big tax cuts and not address some of the other structural problems with the debt is that we borrow increasing amounts of it from countries that enjoy big trade surpluses with us. And as a result of that, what we should have been doing in the last decade, which is going to a a uh, future that was less totally dependent on finance, housing, and consumer spending and had more manufacturing and green technology, that required us both to have more trade agreements and to more vigorously enforce the ones we've got. And since the people who were loaning us money were the same people that had big trade surpluses with us, our trade enforcement dropped 80% in the last decade, 80%, for good reasons. Nobody slugs their banker. I mean, you're not going to get up tomorrow morning and have an extra cup of coffee and go down and just knock the living daylights out of your personal banker. Could you get a loan the next day? So this is, a, this is going to take some time to work out. But the, the main point I want to make that you started with is I don't think that the Democrats or the Republicans should conclude from the New York race that no changes can be made in Medicare, that no changes can be made in Social Security, that no changes can be made in the tax system, that no changes can be made that will deal with this long-term debt problem. Because we can't allow ourselves to be so paralyzed by the present and by people's preference for present certainty and present benefits that we stop creating the future. America's always been about the future, and if we stop being a future country, we're going to be in real trouble. So we have this immediate logjam, uh, whether it's the Gang of Five or whether it's the meetings that are happening that Vice President Biden is trying to negotiate. Uh, the, the basic disagreement seems to be about whether there will be revenue increases, whether you call them fees, whether you call them taxes. You're in the room, and you want to bust through to some sort of agreement. How do you do that? I think you have to, first of all, say <clears throat> that our, our revenues when I was <clears throat> president were very low. 
as a percentage of our GDP, but that's because our growth rate was so high. And there is a premium, a revenue premium to high growth rates, <clears throat> but high growth rates are not achieved by low taxes alone at the expense of fiscal responsibility. That's the real lesson of my eight years that is applicable to this eight years. Arithmetic still matters. It was one of my greatest one-liners when people said, what great new idea did you bring to Washington when you became president? I always said arithmetic. So the, the idea that the lower the tax rates are, the better everything will be has been debunked now for 30 years, uh, both in positive terms when I was president and in negative terms by quadrupling the debt once and then doubling it again. So, I mean, how many times do we have to see this movie before we know how it ends? On the other hand, could you have taxes that are too high or too stupid? Absolutely. So what I think we have to do is to say that would it be good if the federal revenues were somewhere between 20 and 22 percent and no more at robust growth rates and maybe someday they'd be lower again like they were when I was president? Yeah. They probably can't get as low as they were when I was president until after the baby boomers have died out. Some of this is demographic. And keep in mind, the grandchildren of the baby boomers are more numerous than their parents. So we will have demographic relief from Social Security after about 18 years and from Medicare after about 20, and that'll be a good thing. But uh, I think you just have to make the point. I also think that we may have some room for tax reform here. Uh, the, one of the really impressive accomplishments, I think, of the Bowles Simpsons Commission was pointing out just how much money there is out there in the so-called tax expenditures. And I, I would favor returning individual rates to the, where they were when I was president, uh, and maybe even across the board, but certainly for the upper income people. Uh, then I, th I think you ought to do something with the tax expenditures. On corporate taxes, I have a little different take. I raised corporate tax rates, and I thought it was important because the percentage of the federal pie covered by corporate taxation went way down in the 12 years before I was president. But it is very important <clears throat> to be internationally competitive. So our rates are fairly high compared to all of our competitors, but our loopholes are also fairly high. So if you got rid of a lot of the, the, uh, the tax expenditures on the corporate side, you can actually lower rates and still raise the same amount or more money, and that would make us, I think, look more competitive and be more competitive, but then everybody would have to pay something. You wouldn't have some corporations paying 35% under, and then others paying 10. You talked about arithmetic, and I talked earlier about sacred cows. One of the pieces of arithmetic that, that the Peterson Foundation and these six groups have put on the table is reducing or eliminating the home mortgage interest deduction, a sacred cow if ever there was one. Is that a reasonable arithmetic target? Well, I certainly think it can be reduced. Uh, there's no question that uh, at a million dollars it contributes to inflation. And there's no question, since it only goes to one home, and so many people with a heck of a lot of money have more than one home, um, that, it's, that the absence of it's not a deterrent to getting the house. So I think, it's, I think that that's something that should be reduced. That we, need to, we need to, here's what I think about how far down you should go. You need to look very carefully at these income levels and see how much inequality has increased. And we need to try to structure a tax system that doesn't aggravate it. One of, the, one of the reasons that America is not more productive and that growth rate is not higher is that from World War II to roughly 19, to 1980, the bottom 90% of Americans had 65% of the income. And the top 10% had 35%. And the top 1% had 9%. It was enough inequality to reward people for working hard, having good ideas, starting new businesses, putting people to work, and not so much inequality that it constricted the capacity to build a great middle class and a growing economy. In the last 30 years, those numbers have changed. The 90%, 65% dropped to 52. The 10%, 35%, percent's gone to 48. The 1%, 9%, percent's gone to 21. So that's too much inequality. It is not sustainable. 
And it's the kind of thing you get if you have all your economic growth in finance, consumer spending, and housing, which is what happened before the meltdown. Not enough attention has been given to what happened to America's economy before the financial meltdown in the last decade. We only had two and a half million new jobs. And some of it was 9-11 and its aftermath, but most of it was we didn't have a source of new jobs for this decade that would support a broadly diversified economy. So that's what I think about that. I think, you know, people like me should pay higher taxes. I think that we should be careful on home mortgage deductions, repeal, and everything else, not to do anything that would aggravate inequality at the middle class and lower levels. We've got the only time in the last 30 years when the bottom 20 percent's income increased in percentage terms as much as the top 20 percent was in the second four years I served because we had so many jobs that it tightened the labor market because health care costs increased only as much as inflation for the first time and because we had a lot of supports for working families and for single mothers in the workforce. In spite of that, all that, we didn't do anything to stop the increasing inequality benefiting the top 1 percent. So I just ask you all to think about that. I think that in the back of our minds, we should realize that as we come out of this and create more jobs, we ought to create more consumers, and that requires that the income distribution support a middle-class income and allow poor people to work their way into it. 